Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, and I want to say hello and thank you to everybody for uh, joining uh, this talk. Uh, I'm super excited to give it today. Uh, I've been actually um, giving tons of talks this past month, and uh, this is one by far one of my favorites. So uh, yeah, let's get started. And by the way, uh, if anyone, I guess, has questions or whatever, I figure uh, we could talk about them after. So real quick, here's an agenda into uh, what I'm going to speak about today. Uh, I'm just going to cover a little bit about software development life cycles and how they relate to CICD. I'm going to talk about uh, DevOps and how they integrate into pipelines. And then just talk about securing those pipelines, right? Some of the things uh, that folks are having trouble with uh, regarding security and pipelines, and then uh, just recapping it all. So uh, my name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate for CircleCI. And in my role at CircleCI, I'm basically out engaging uh, the developer community, uh, the technology com community in general, actually. And uh, in these conversations that I have with folks, I'm always uh, really super surprised and excited to learn how people are using uh, technology in their day-to-day. -day. Uh, also, uh, learning, you know, what what actually ails them as well, right? When using these te technologies, so uh, in these conversations, it's it becomes apparently clear, you know, uh, there's there's some lacking in uh, security, which is kind of the inspiration for this talk, uh, and specifically security within uh, CI/CD pipelines and CI/CD tooling. Uh, so uh, there's my Twitter handle at the bottom. Uh, so if anyone wants to reach out to me. Uh, online after the event, um, feel free to, you know, reach out via Twitter. It's the, the best medium to get me on these days. Uh, so yeah, if you need to reach out to me or want to reach out, discuss pretty much anything, uh, hit me up at, at Punk Data uh, on Twitter. So let's start with uh, the history of software development. I like to kind of start in the past and then talk about how uh, things are impacted today and how, you know, the, his, the history of things and then talk about how things are actually occurring today. So um, when I started developing software back in the day, our software development practices are basically of, of a uh, method called waterfall. Uh, I'm not sure if there's people on uh, or attending that, that actually understand what waterfall is. So I'm going to cover that a little bit, but basically um, in the waterfall software development, uh, life cycle or, or, or strategy, uh, you're basically given a bunch of work, right? So um, these are obviously requirements for software. And the way it used to work was, you know, you'd get a project and they they basically give you all of the requirements all at once, uh, which wasn't really a problem. But the, the, the problem actually became uh, prevalent later on in the process when you were developing your software uh, and, um, you know, you were given basically all of the work up front, even if you broke it down into smaller components, it still was, um, the way that we developed software was, uh, the methodology was that, uh, you would develop a, you know, a little bit of, of your task or your, so or your software, or your, the stuff you're responsible for, but there was always a dependency on something being completed before you were able to complete your specific project. So as you can imagine, that would end up with causing a lot of blockage, right? In, in, in how we develop software. So again, right, if you look at this diagram of, of the waterfall kind of development process at the top, right, they give you the, the requirements analysis is completed, then they kind of create a high level design. And then they kind of break that apart and give you basically a whole chunk of, of work to do all at once. And again, right, so if I'm working on a project or a piece of a project and my coworkers or my peers are working on another, a couple other pieces of the project, there's going to be dependencies there in the waterfall development lifecycle where, you know, I have to do, I have to wait, even if I finish it two weeks early, I still have to wait for my other team mates to finish their piece of this, this project, right? And obviously, right, that, that leaves that leads to blocking uh, situations and that extends, right, the, the life cycle of that, that software and that project. And back in the day, right, it used to take quite a bit of time to get things done, be, be, mainly because of these situations where we're developing in this waterfall development uh, manner. 
And um, yeah, so just keep a, an eye on this diagram, right? You can see where everything's kind of blocking and sequential. And uh, right, uh, it's just as you can see, it just slows things down. Now, we're developers, right? We're technology people. We realize that this is inefficient and unoptimized. Uh, so right around 2000s, right, 1999, 2000s, this um, manifesto came about, which is the Agile Manifesto. So this is where a bunch of really smart people got together and decided that, yeah, we can develop software in a better manner, right? And it kind of got coined the term, uh, this new kind of development software uh, process was coined as Agile. And all they really did was look at waterfall and the way that we were developing software previously and decided to figure out that well okay so now we we were building things right in in mass and in volume uh they decided to take those tasks that were being kind of that were blocking everything and they broke it apart right so now when you take those tasks that you had and you were able to break things apart into smaller chunks then people can actually you know accomplish a couple of things, which is uh, understanding the scope of the tasks that they're assigned, as well as being able to develop, uh, you know, those, the, the requirements for that, for that, for that task uh, rather quickly. And then they were able to go back and get another piece of, of, of work, right. Or another uh, task that's on the list in the sprint. So if you look at the center of this diagram, you can see there's a scrum master product owner, right. And then the development team. And basically all of these people are participants in this agile software development cycle. Uh, and there's a lot of movement here, right? Unlike the other, the previous diagram I showed you for waterfall, there's a lot of arrows and circles, right? And the idea there again was to just speed things up, right? Break things apart, make them small, smaller, more manageable and uh, be able to accomplish these things much faster. And then you can come back, right? And finish one thing, come back and, and, and uh, work on another task, right? To help help with the cause. But as you can see again, right, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of, of, of things happening at the same time, which again is very different from the waterfall uh, development process. So once we created this agile system, right, uh, which created uh, again, a lot of speed, made things more efficient as far as managing projects and, and tasks within software development, we're smart enough to understand those patterns, right? Identify those patterns. And that's where kind of continuous delivery and CICD was kind of born out of, um, you know, once the agile patterns were established, uh, we could also then create these practices and principles around those patterns in agile that help us kind of, again, get that, get that movement going, right? Continuous integration, continuous delivery, making sure that your code is being implemented as quickly as possible into the, the, the code base uh, and that your peers are actually being able to, you know, take a look at that work you've done and collaborate on it. And then of course the delivery piece uh, or the deployment piece was, is where, you know, you're actually releasing the, that work you've done, right? So this is, I'm sure most of you have seen this diagram before. Uh, I call it like the uh, CICD DevOps infinity loop. And it just basically defines the different general phases of software development. And, and then also on the ops side, it also defines like the release processes, right? And, and they're just generic kind of um, identifiers for, for how this process goes. Uh, but it's a really nice graphic to kind of show again, the movement of where things start and how they end. And, if you can see here, right, they don't really end. They just start over again because software's kind of always iterating, right, and, and changing and, and being released. So this is a great kind of visual for, for CICD and DevOps. But CICD in general is uh, a practice and a principle, right? So, um, and here are some of the principles for CI. So we're talking about continuous integration at, at this point, and they generally apply to developers, right, in the development sense. Uh, so, right, one of the benefits is uh, you're writing and committing code often, right, taking that uh, instead of waiting for some other folks to finish their project, developers can individually contribute at, at, at a pace that's kind of suited to their, their uh, work, kind of work uh, cadence. 
Uh, also, you're committing to a shared code repository. So that means anybody can who pulls those changes down into their branch can actually see what's happening within your code and what you're working on so that there are no, you know, kind of gotchas when everything's kind of merged together, right? This is a great way for collaboration. Uh, then you're testing code, right? So on every commit for the most part. Uh, and this is my, the most favorite part of or the benefit from, from CICD for me, at least, is the fast feedback loops, right? So knowing when things are broken, knowing when you have problems before you actually commit them to any code base, that's always awesome, right? Um, so let's talk about continuous deployment. Uh, and again, that on the, on the infinity loop side, right, that's more of the operational kind of uh, principles. And basically, right, what we're trying to achieve here is creating the latest release of your code, right, into, into artifacts, right, we're generating artifacts, uh, then we're deploying those to whatever target environments or resources uh, that, you know, we're, we're pushing our code to and that people are using uh, our services on. Uh, we're also validating, right, that our apps and services are functioning, meaning once they're deployed, everything's kind of checked to make to, to ensure that, you know, we're getting the, uh, the application uh, that we're, the performance from the application that we're expecting and also uh, all the data and stuff that, com that comes out of that application, making sure everything's kind of tip top for, for the operations, uh, operation of that, of that software. And then finally, we want to monitor and verify that again, the application is performing as well as, uh, or as, as expected. And uh, if there's any issues, right, we, if we can establish some sort of recovery system uh, so that the software kind of self heals. So those are the practices and principles of CICD, meaning the, you know, these are the things that are kind of um, the, the, the principles that are shared by every team member, right, and the organization. Uh, but in order to make those CICD practices and principles principles of reality, you have to implement automation, right? And that's where kind of a CICD pipeline comes into play, uh, or a CICD tooling uh, platform like Circle CI uh, comes into play, right? We, we enable people to actually make that those practices and principles of reality using automation. Uh, and basically, you know, when you establish a CICD pipeline, it's, it's no different than any kind of like segmented pipeline you have maybe in like a, a plumbing situation, right? There's phases of a, of a, of a, of a plumbing uh, system that, you know, it goes through some of the, some are elbow joints, some are, some are uh, angle joints for, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to get around corners, uh, but it's, it's essentially a pipeline, right? Uh, and if you think about it that way, uh, it's just segmented pieces of work so that your processes are kind of, again, if you think about that agile uh, space I was talking about, right, we're chunking up the work into smaller scalable or scaled out or scoped out uh, the chunks, uh, right, that we can actually operate on and understand a little easier. So here's an example of a CICD pipeline taken right out of one of my uh, Circle CI dashboards. Um, if you can look to the to the left, you can see what's happening here, right? Um, I'm developing, or I'm, I'm uh, my my pipeline. I changed some code. My pipeline's triggered, and what's happening is at the bottom, I'm running tests. I'm building Docker images for that application, and then I'm also creating a GK cluster, which is a Kubernetes cluster uh, that I intend to deploy this application to. Now, the on the left, you see that I'm running three things at the same time. Those are running concurrently or in parallel. Uh, and again, um, you know, we're trying to chunk the work up into smaller bite-sized manageable pieces. And that's how you do that within a pipeline, right? You define the things that you want to do, and then you can actually create what we call jobs around those. Uh, and as you can see, right, I'm, then I'm deploying this application. So all those little lines that you see there are what we call dependencies. So that kind of leans back over to uh, what I was talking about, about waterfall deployments or, or development, I should say. Uh, remember we have dependencies, so things can't progress until one thing is, is complete. In this case, the only thing that's really dependent on this or should be dependent on is that that Kubernetes cluster is created so that we can deploy our application. Now, if I had some like uh, requirement that my tests need to actually run, which I do here, uh, then if any of those three fail, uh, the deployment of the application will not occur. So again, this is just a quick kind of visual to show you what a CICD pipeline means in the sense that uh, I was speaking of. So let's talk about, uh, right, when we're integrating pipelines into, uh, when we're integrating uh, the, our pipelines into our workflows, into our CICD platforms. 
Uh, these integrations basically have different types. And the reason we have different types is because we're connecting into different systems, right? So just because we're running a CICD pipeline, like, I, like you saw earlier, I was creating a GKE cluster, I have to integrate my pipeline into like uh, GCP, right? Or Google Cloud Platform. In order for me to do that, I need credentials, secrets, right? And these integration types that I'm talking about can come in a bunch of different flavors, right? One, the one I just described is more like I'm jump, jumping into a cloud provider, right? And connecting into there and creating things. Uh, with this other kind of type, we have so, a list here, right? Of vulnerability scanning tools. We can integrate things like sneak into uh, our pipelines to ensure that, you know, we're, we're doing some static analysis or we're scanning containers before they get deployed. Uh, we're also, you know, able to integrate with APIs, right? If we want to just grab some data from a service, uh, obviously uh, database access and, you know, infrastructure as, as code tooling as well. So since we're integrating all of these things into our pipelines, right? All these other services, databases, APIs, whatever, um, you know, we're, we're kind of now having to be cognizant of the fact that we're, we're, we're actually, you know, we have to protect credentials. We're using credentials, we're utilizing them within our pipeline. So we need to protect that. And there's always been this security element to DevOps, but I don't think it was highly, um, uh, I would say <laughs> highly respected. Uh, it, was, it was kind of ignored, right? And in the past few years, we're seeing this now kind of term called DevSecOps, which is basically where you know, teams are performing uh, dev, uh, DevOps kind of operations or, 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 or they're establishing DevOps cultures. Uh, but now there's an emphasis on security, right? So that's where DevSecOps kind of mm -hmm. comes in. And obviously the, the, the SEC part of DevSecOps stands for security. Now, if you've heard this term shift left and you don't understand it, I can explain it for you a little bit. Um, if you remember my diagram where I had uh, the, the pipeline showing, all the way to the left, you saw a bunch of things happening, right? I was running unit tests. I was building Docker images. I was also creating a, a GKE cluster. Uh, in that same uh, uh, column of things happening, I could have created a job, right? That's actually doing a security scan on my code or a vulnerability scan on my code. And that's what they mean by shifting left. Before uh, this, this terminology or of shift left or this concept of shift left, things were kind of just like, right? Uh, our pipelines used to look like the one I just showed you where everything was happening up front and it was all mainly developer centric, right? So developers were, or, or they were just performing jobs that kind of developers knew about. But with the new tooling that we have today, developers are actually empowered to do more about security, right? So now we can actually uh, do, using these tools, we can actually do security scans on our own without having to kind of get it, getting it blessed by a security team, right? Which is literally would happen later on down on the right side of your pipeline, right? So the further down your pipeline you went, uh, there probably was a step where, you know, you had a security team going in, checking out or running some scans on this release before it got, got uh, pushed out to a whatever target environment. So again, security regarding shifting left, it just means that those security practices that were being, or, or operations and processes that were conducted further down your pipeline are now being done generally by like in the development phase, right? So one of the examples is if you use open source software, let's say you're using Node.js, um, you can now have uh, scanning tools right at the, in, at, the, at the beginning of your pipeline, scanning that code to ensure that you don't have any vulnerabilities, that you're not packaging up vulnerabilities. And if you do, you can stop that build. The developer can update his dependencies, right? And make sure that, uh, that, that those uh, security flags are, are, are solved or, or resolved before pushing any bad code or you know, uh, uh, a vulnerable code into the, the, the public or the uh, shared, shared repositories. So I hope, I hope I gave you a good definition of, of shift left. If not, uh, we can definitely talk about it after. So like I said earlier, um, you know, when you have your pipelines, you can do these vulnerability scans. You can ensure that you're not pushing uh, buggy or vulnerable code uh, right into a shared repository and then pushing that out to your customers. Um, 
one of the ways you can do that is by doing what we call static analysis or application scanning, right? You can just have a job like I showed in my, in my diagram there uh, that, that can conduct all of these things. Um, sometimes you would have multiple jobs scanning for different things. Um, you can do things like container scanning of your pipelines. I, and I, hi I highly encourage you to do all of these things if you, if you have um, the capabilities. Uh, there are a lot of free open source tools out there that kind of help with at least initially getting, you know, some reading on, on what's going on with the software. Um, I know obviously there's some paid uh, as well, but uh, for the most part, there's plenty of, of tools out there that can help with the scans and ensuring that you're as protected as you, you, you can be, right? It's better than running nothing in most cases. Uh, actually, in all cases, it's better than running nothing. Uh, but definitely, you know, look at, uh, especially if you're, if you're pushing containers into, or uh, if you're developing Docker images with your application or you're yeah, pushing your applications into those, those uh those kind of uh, artifacts, which are Dr. Images, definitely uh, look into container scanning uh, within your pipelines. Uh, yeah, right. So now that we have this integration right into other services, other tooling, and now we have security kind of running uh, within our pipelines, we need to also address things like uh, the integration access, right? So like I mentioned earlier, um, we have the capability for connecting into other on the other services. One of the biggest things that I find um, issues with within CICD pipelines is uh, basically folks don't understand that, you know, or, or they understand, but they don't really pay attention to the fact that you have these credentials and you, you know, you have to protect them. And these credentials can impact services like OAuth, right? They can represent access keys for like I don't know, let's talk about AWS uh, or, or, you know, whatever service you're trying to connect to. They also cover like API tokens and your basic username and password, right? I've seen so many people just write this stuff out into their configuration files for their pipelines. And it's so, you know, it's just in clear text. It's very unprotected. So these are just some of the things, right, that kind of come up when people are, leveraging CICD pipelines to make, you know, their, uh, their practices and principles come to life. Now, I'm going to talk about securing these pipelines a little bit. And what I want to do is address one of the main problems that I see all the time uh, within, within these pipelines. So secrets, which are the things I just talked about, credentials, passwords, API tokens, whatever you want to call them. I'm just going to call them secrets uh, moving forward with this, with this presentation. So again, right, secrets provide access to databases, APIs, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to connect to, systems that you're trying to connect to. Uh, they are sensitive information. They could be sensitive information as well, but you definitely want to have them protected. And that's the point. And again, like I talk, uh, said earlier, right, people have uh, uh, unprotected secrets all the time within their pipelines. Uh, and of course, right, if you have that situation, you're basically exposing yourself uh, to, uh, you know, unwanted attacks. Uh, the biggest problem that I see, though, within pipelines, uh, aside from, uh, I don't see as much anymore, uh, the, the clear text stuff that, that I'm talking about, but what I do see is weak and stale secrets. So, these are things that um, the weak, obviously, right? These are just things like, like it says there in the background, passwords, right? People just use a, a very simple uh, password that they can remember, right? And that's one of the reasons why they do it. Uh, but I can tell you that that's no longer very safe, right? There's so many tools out there to do brute force attacks and, and get into your systems really easily. Uh, the other piece to it, the other part that I see all the time is uh, passwords are, or, or secrets are stale. And what I mean by that is, you know, they don't change, you know, uh, in some organizations, you have to change your, your secrets every what, I don't know, 30 days, 60 days, depending on, on where you work. I've worked in uh, federal organizations where it was every like uh, 30 days, which I thought was kind of ridiculous, uh, because, you know, things happen. Uh, and I, I, I was expecting shorter, uh, uh, you know, uh, password expiry policies, but that's okay, right? So whatever it is, um, you still should be changing or refreshing these, these secrets uh, very random or frequently, I should say. Uh, 
the other thing I talked about, obviously, right, was inadequate mechanisms. What I mean by that is, um, and this goes back to the clear text piece, uh, when you're running uh, these, uh, these pipelines, right, and you have jobs in your pipelines, some of them, again, have to connect to some other system. And the issue is that, you know, uh, the CICD tooling will have very good protections, right? It'll, it'll enable you to establish your your uh, secrets in what we call environment variables or, or in some other mechanism that at rest on the platform, they're encrypted. In flight, they're encrypted. But once it hits that runtime where you're running your actual code for your build, which is like what we call an executor, then there are, there are uh, security kind of flaws in some of those systems. And one of them is obviously the clear text, right? So you have all these credentials, they're safely stored, they're safely uh, transported into the runtime and then boom, once it hits the runtime, it has to be decrypted, right? So, so the services can, can use those, those, uh, those secrets. Uh, the issue is that uh, if someone, right, for the time frame that that, that, that uh, runtime is, is uh, alive, uh, you, you now have an exposure, right? Or potential exposure. So as long as those, those secrets are, are uh, in clear text sitting on, on that runtime, if, if someone gains act, a bad actor gains access to that, um, you, know, you potentially now have exposed yourself and your organization, which is not a good thing, right? Depending on, on the level of credentials, uh, it's not a good thing. So what I propose, right, uh, for folks who are having that issue with securing their, their, their pipelines or the secrets within their pipelines, is implementing a, a system that's called the secrets management system. And if you're not familiar with what that is, um, basically it's a set of tooling or, or platforms that um, you know, live outside of, of the actual uh, CICD tooling. Uh, and this is a, 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 a system that's designed to basically secure all of your information and then also dole them out right to the appropriate services calling on them. So. Uh, let's say, for instance, you have, uh, you know, AWS keys and you, you have a, uh, a secrets management system running. You could actually, you know, set up the system where the services um, can dole out uh, random, randomly generated secrets to access the system that you're, you're going for, right? Or you're targeting. So uh, with the, with the uh, should say, the, uh, the uh, secrets management system, um, you're able to protect the secrets and then also authenticate identities of folks, right? So it's again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice protective layer for all that sensitive information that you need to integrate within your pipelines, right? Um, I personally have been using uh, the uh, the HashiCorp Vault uh, secret system or management system. Uh, it's an open source project which I like, and it's also very easy to kind of get up and running quickly. Uh, but there's plenty of other right secrets management systems out there. Uh, the major cloud providers they all have their own kind of secret management system as well. So if you're like if you want to stick with one particular uh, you know service, then you could actually do that. Um, but again, I, I I prefer the HashiCorp Vault system because again I, I can control it a little bit better and it's outside of kind of that vendor vendor lock-in as well. Uh, but yeah. You can use pretty much any any secrets management system that's out there, um, but you know again, if you're leveraging that, um, it helps with creating randomly generate passwords, right? Which is helps with that staleness expiry password expiry problem that I was talking about earlier. Uh, it also can rotate those stale passwords as well, right? So not only will you generate a really strong password that no one can remember, uh, you can also rotate it in a, in, a, in a schedule, right? On a schedule. So it's, it's, it's up to you and your, your security teams and your policies on how you rotate or when you rotate, but it just has that capability for you to do that, right? Which is really awesome. It also can help you with, you know, if you have requirements for like uh, seeing who exactly is on a system, which is actually pretty common these days. Um, so like it gives you the ability to have granular access controls and understand, you know, uh, assign roles and privileges accordingly, right? So you can do things like, uh, you know, least privilege roles uh, so that you're not giving away the farm all in one shot. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a really good uh, system for helping you, right? Uh, keep your access controls uh, in place and, and, and 
not compromised. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically it uh, as far as um, the talk goes. So I'll just do a quick recap on, on what I just uh, discussed. Um, right, continuous integration principles, uh, write and commit code often, uh, commit to a shared repository, and then right, you have the fast feedback loop so that you know what's broken as soon as possible and you can, be, you can fix that and move on to the next task in your list. Uh, with the continuous deployment principles, Go ahead and you know it helps you create these artifacts uh, in a really quick manner helps you validate uh, your services and make sure ensures that they're functioning uh, and also helps you monitor and verify uh, the state of those applications after you deploy them right so um, and also right you can you can look into uh, recovery or self-healing type operations so that if the application does have any issues, it can shut itself down and restart or respawn a new uh, service, you know, uh, in, in, in addition to or, or to replace the, the stuff that's broken or has failed. Uh, with DevSecOps, right, we're talking about uh, shifting left, right, on the security front. Uh, like I said, all that means is that um, you're moving those security type processes to, to the forefront or the front line of your, of your uh, CICD pipeline uh, so that, you know, the developers are more involved, your operation teams are more involved in what's happening with security. And then it kind of um, can, again, you know, take some weight off of your uh, security teams uh, down the road down, or down the pipeline, I should say. Um, it just kind of helps things move things along instead of, you know, waiting and being dependent on someone else to check things. Uh, definitely implement uh, application or static scanning within your pipelines, as well as uh, container uh, scanning within your pipelines. And then, um, you know, securing these pipelines, make sure that you implement or look into implementing some sort of secrets management policies or tooling. Um, Integrating those secrets is really important because, again, you're trying to protect that information um, as, as, as uh, well, as protected as possible, right? Uh, it's really important that you do that. I can't stress that enough. Uh, and then, obviously, right, generating strong random passwords as well as rotating uh, those secrets out at, at a timely manner or, or in a manner that is kind of, I guess, required by your, your policies at your organization. And that's the end of my talk. So um, if you, is there any questions and answers or we can do that. <laughs> and if you need to get in touch with me, just hit me up at Punk Data. Thank you, everybody.